Hello students, welcome back to my class. Today we are going to study Martin Esslin's introduction to the theatre of the absurd. And as per the syllabus, we will only confine to the introductory part where he is discussing in a very brief manner about different aspects of the new theatre that was emerging during his time, which he himself had coined as the theatre of the absurd. And we will only confine ourselves to the introductory part. We won't go into the main text because there we find lot of elaboration and which is not there in our syllabus. So, Martin Esslin was a Hungary born Austrian Jew who engaged himself in various fields of dramatic production, direction and dramatic critical writing throughout his career. He was a scholar was also an activist, we can say, in this particular field and coming to his contemporary period that was the first part of 20th century, we can say that this was a period when dramatic literature was on the way of revival in the western world. And in the very early part, we had seen the revival of poetic drama, the revival of epic drama, the epic theater, and also the conventional theater in the form of the realistic drama. But at the same time, there are also various experiments on both theme and structure of the drama in different parts of Europe. Different playwrights who were not associated with each other by any means were experimenting in their own way with the theme and the style. And the reason for that we can find that the contemporary socio-political environment in Europe, which had witnessed two world wars in the second and the fourth decade of the century, had made human life meaningless in a certain way. It made human life devoid of purpose, devoid of truth, devoid of any meaning. So, writers, dramatists, they wanted to represent this sense of senselessness, we can say, or this sense of deep frustration with the self through their literary endeavor. And Martin Eslin, as a dramatic scholar and professor analyzed these various experiments in different parts of Europe and had discovered some commonality within these experiments and he wanted to give it a new name and he coined this new name, the theatre of the absurd, by referring to Albert Camus, the myth of Sisyphus, where Camus is talking about the concept of absurd or the explaining the word of absurd by telling that human condition is senseless and absurd. So, that was the condition 
in that contemporary world. So, from there he picked up the word absurd and he used it in the way of referring to those diffused emergence of a new theater. So, these new playwrights, these experimental playwrights in different parts of Europe, among them he had enlisted the names like Samuel Beckett from Ireland, Arthur Adamov from Russia, Eugene Ionesco, a Romanian French, and Jean Janet, a French playwright. And he is telling that these people, they were experimenting in the theatre to represent a shattered world and values which they had witnessed. The world that had lost the eternal truth, values, unity, order and thus any meaning and sensitivity in living experiences that was being represented by these playwrights in their own individual manner. So, in the text, he is trying to give a shape to various characteristics of this dramatic movement, though it was not in the way of a movement, but still he wanted to give it a shape by bringing them together through certain common characteristics. So, he begins his text by referring to the incident or the staging of such a drama on 19 November 1957 by a group of actors that was San Francisco Actors Workshop who were staging Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot in different parts of Europe and they had come to the San Quentin Penitentiary to stage this drama before the inmates or the convicts. And they were very nervous because they did not know how these convicts will be reacting to this particular drama which had already baffled the very intelligent, cosmopolitan and sophisticated audiences in different big cities like Paris, London, etc. And when the drama began, there was initially a few minutes of commotion, but after that suddenly these actors guild, they discovered that the audience, they became so silent, so much observing within the play. So, this created certain reactions in different quarters, in the media, in the officials of the jail and also among the actors of this group. And in certain media reports, it was expressed that why these people were able to decipher the true meaning of this drama, which baffled or confused or puzzled the more intelligent theater audiences in the cities. Because these people in the penitentiary, the convicts, they know what is the meaning of waiting, the agonies associated with waiting they had their own experiences. Therefore, they could identify themselves with this drama and its theme. And to them, the outer society is Godo, whom they are waiting. And there is no guarantee when Godo will arrive or it may not arrive. 
So in this way, Martin Nesselin is begin, beginning in his introduction that what exactly is the difference between the staging of such type of plays before different audiences and why it was not accepted by the more intelligible audiences of big cities. And he is telling that the reception of waiting for Godot at San Quentin and the wide acclaim given to the plays by Ionesco, Adamov, Printer and others testify that these plays, which are so often superciliously dismissed as nonsense or mystification, have something to say and can be understood. So, these plays are not actually supercilious, meaningless. These are having certain meaning within. And that these type of plays, they are part of a new and still developing stage convention that has not yet been generally understood and has hardly ever been defined. So, Martin Neslin is taking the endeavor to define this new development in the theatre or in the stage. And he is telling that these plays pursue ends quite different from those of the conventional play. These are not like conventional play. Why? Because these plays do not have any conventional structure. Neither they are having the conventional plot or story, nor the conventional characterization, nor the conventional dialogue or language. So, they can be judged only by the standards of the theatre of the absurd, which is the purpose of this book to define and clarify. So, he is telling in the introduction why I am writing this book because I want to clarify and justify that these type of plays, they can be clubbed together, grouped together under the theatre of the absurd. And he is further elaborating by telling that it is an oversimplification to assume that any age presents a homogeneous pattern. These plays are quite different from each other. The playwrights are coming from different cultures, different socio-political experiences. Their experiments were not homogeneous. And ours being more than most others, an age of transition, it displays a bewilderingly stratified picture. And moreover, the early part of 20th century was a most complex period because it was a highly transitive period when things were changing in a very fast manner. The development of technology, the world wars, the socio-political equations in different parts of the world, all were changing very fast and the human society, human values were changing very fast. So, he is calling this period as a very fast changing transitional period that is throwing off many challenges, many problems before the people as well as the artist, as well as the playwrights. So, the theatre of the absurd, however, can be seen as the reflection of what seems to be the attitude most genuinely representative of our own time. And he is telling that the theatre of absurd is probably representing more comprehensively the transitional turmoil of this particular period. The hallmark of this attitude is its sense that the certitudes and unsackable basic assumptions of former ages have been swept away and they have been tested and found wanting. So, the very first characteristic of this particular age is that the age was lacking the certitudes of the previous ages. There is no certainty and also the unshakable basic assumptions were changed. They are also not remaining the basic assumptions. Every moment they are going through the changes. Therefore, the world that was being explained earlier 
true reasoning is now very difficult to explain with that. Therefore, the universe is suddenly deprived of illusions and of light. Man feels a stranger. So here, man is feeling himself as a stranger because there is neither reason nor illusions nor any convention. Therefore, man is finding every moment himself as if he had been, he has been detached from something, he has been an alien in this world. He is an irremediable exile and because he is deprived of memories of a lost homeland as much as lacks the hope of promised land to come. So, man is oscillating between the past, its certitude, its promises and the present time which is a hopeless period, aimless period, nothing is visible, nothing is certain. This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his sitting, setting truly constitutes the feeling of absurdity. So, the feeling of absurdity is coming from this divorce between man and his immediate environment, man and his setting and he is defining what is absurd. So, absurd is originally coming from the music where it suggests a disharmonious state and which is also unreasonable or illogical. But in his essay on Kafka, Ionesco defined absurd as devoid of purpose. Absurd is that which is devoid of purpose, cut off from his religious, metaphysical and transcendental roots, man is lost. All his actions become senseless, absurd, useless. So, the absurdity that Martin Eslin is talking about, it is not the absurdity of music, but it is the absurdity that Ionesco is talking about Kafka. Uh, sorry. Yes, Ionesco is talking about Kapka. And then he is, Martin Eslin is moving further by differentiating between existentialism, that was the part of that particular period, and, and the theatre of absurd, the existentialist drama and the theatre of absurd. He is telling that the playwrights or writers like Anuili, Salakru, Sate, Camus, Giradox, they are the existentialist writers. And what is the difference between the existentialist and the theatre of absurd? Existentialism is representing the absurdity through a conventional manner. But the absurdists, they are representing the absurdity in the unconventional manner or in an absurd manner. That is the basic difference he is pointing out and he is telling that in some senses the theatre of Sate and Camus is less adequate as an expression of the philosophy of Sate and Camus in artistic as distinct from philosophic term than the theatre of the absurd. Camus argued that in our disillusioned age, the world has ceased to make any sense. He did so in the elegantly rationalistic and discursive style of an 18th century moralist. So, they are approaching this senselessness, this absurdity, this divorce between man and his environment in a very rationalistic discursive style. And Camus in Satya and Camus in the relentless probing still by the implication proclaim a tacit conviction that logical discourse can offer valid solutions, that the analysis of language will lead to the over uncovering of the basic concept, platonic ideas. So, this is the concept of the existentialist dramatists, but the absurd is absurd, theatre of absurd, it is differing in the sense that in striving 
for an integration between the subject matter and the form in which it is expressed that separates the theatre of the absurd from existentialist theatre. And then he is making a comparison between the poetic avant-garde, which was very popular at that time in France and that of theatre of absurd. He is telling that poetic avant-garde theatre, there the dramatist like Gelo de Rod, Jax Odiberti, George Novex, what they are doing? They are relying on fantasy and dream reality as much as the theatre of the absurd does, but also disregard such traditional axioms as that of the basic unity and consistency of each character on the need for the plot. There is certain similarity between poetic avant-garde and the theatre of absurd. But the poetic avant-garde represents a different mood. It is more lyrical and far less violent and grotesque. Theatre of absurd is more violent and grotesque, but it is less violent and grotesque and it is more lyrical and it is representing a mood. Even more important in its different attitude towards language, the poetic avant-garde relies to a far greater extent on consciously poetic speech. It aspires to plays that are in effect poems, images composed of a rich web of verbal association. And it is giving us the images composed of rich web of verbal association. But in theatre of absurd, again there is the images, but these images are not associated with the verbal expressions. Therefore, the theatre of the absurd we find tends towards a radical devaluation of language. So, theatre of absurd is devaluating the language because it is not relying on the language to relate to the image it is presenting. Therefore, the theatre of absurd is thus part of the anti-literary movement of our time. But then he is telling that another thing that he is trying to tell that theatre absurd, certain people in his time they believe that it is of French origin and it is dealing with more with the contemporary French intellectual endeavour. But he is telling that theatre of absurd is not essentially French. It is broadly based on the ancient standard strands of western tradition and has its exponents in Britain, Spain, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Eastern Europe, United States as well as in France. And then he is talking about then why people are thinking that theatre of absurd is associated with France. He is telling that France being the powerhouse of theatrical experiments and theatrical production in his time. And for that he is finding out three reasons. That he is telling the first reason why France was the powerhouse of theatrical experiment or theatrical production. The first reason he is telling, it was having a cosmopolitan environment because it was providing the intellectual debate and shelter to those scholars, dramatists, poets who came over to Paris and they had that sense of freedom to express their ideas, ideologies, concepts, etc. So, the cosmopolitan environment of France was responsible for being the powerhouse of new experimental theatres and the production centre of the theatre. Secondly, he is telling that Paris was also a centre of excellent and experimental stagecraft and production 
techniques. In those days, because there were so many plays being staged there and so many writers and dramatists were gathered together, that on the stagecraft, on the front of the stagecraft and production, there were so many experiments and the standard of the staging was quite considerably higher than the contemporary other cities in Europe. Therefore, the playwrights preferred to come to this place to stage their plays. And thirdly, he is talking about the audience. He is telling that Paris also has a highly intelligent theatre going public, which is receptive, thoughtful and as able as it is eager to absorb the new ideas. And that is more important. The audience for whom the drama is there, they were more intelligent and receptive. They were also thoughtful in absorbing the new theatre. So, for this reason, Paris had emerged as the powerhouse of the theatre in the first part of 20th century in Europe. Then he is telling that the purpose of his book, it is to provide a framework of reference that will show the works of the theatre of the absurd within their own convention, so that their relevance and force can emerge as clearly to the reader as waiting for Godard did to the convicts of San Quentin. So, he is trying to write in his book the different characteristics that emerged from analyzing these different playwrights and their plays to tell the readers that theatre of absurd is one emerging trend in the theatre, European theatre. So, what are the particular characteristics of this theatre? He is telling the theatre of the absurd endeavoured to break through the barrier of insensitivity and to bring humanity to human beings. So, theatre of absurd is representing the purposelessness of life, but it is not purposeless, it is not aimless. It is trying to bring human beings to human beings, humanity to human beings. And it represents through its grotesque, frivolous and irrelevant form a return to the original religious function of the theatre of the confrontation of man with the spears of myth and religious reality. So, through those grotesque, frivolous and other means, it is trying to represent the spears of myth and religious reality and making it a confrontation with the man of modern society. Therefore, he is telling that the theatre of action sorry, the theatre of absurd, it does not have a, does not have to tell a story. In the front of the theme, it abolishes causes, effect and sequence. There is no cause, no effect, no sequence. It does not have a plot, it does not have a proper story. And secondly, it does not have a proper character, because we again find that the abolition of the development of character to their logistic point. Characters are there, but they are not having a logistic development in the like in the conventional theatre. Rather, they are representing some shadowy and inconsistent personalities. And on the language front, it ab abolishes the smooth flow of language. It does not have the smooth flow of language, rather sometimes it becomes the babblings of the madman. Therefore, it is also called as anti-literary. The language used in 
theater of absurd is anti literary and sometimes is devaluated and minimized to very a subordinate role and then he is telling that it is giving a shock to the audience why it shocks the audience into their senses by presenting a grotesquely heightened and distorted picture of a world that has gone mad therefore he is telling that through the shock by taking out of their so called normality the audience are thrown into facing the real normality of that time which may be in comparison to the conventional reality is chaotic is incomprehensible therefore he is telling that this the reality that is served in the theater of absurd is actually the psychological reality which is expressed in images which are the projections of the states of mind of the author dreams nightmares conflicts within the author's mind are projected as visions the dramatic tension that arises out of such play is different from the conventional play so these are the basic characteristics of the theater of absurd and it is contrasting with the conventional play or what we call as a good play that in another, in the conventional play there was story plot subtlety of characterization motifs fully explained theme with a beginning middle and an end but these plays they do not have any of them characters are mechanical puppets and no story or plot exist instead of holding a mirror to nature and portraying the manners and mannerism of the age in fine sketches these plays often seem to be the reflection of dreams and nightmares instead of witty rejoinders and direct dialogues these plays often consist of incoherent babblings so this is the comparison between the conventional play and the theater of absurd and then the final thing we can say about theater of absurd is that the movement of the play in the conventional theater we find the play is moving in a linear manner but in the theater of absurd it moves in a circular manner it moves around and around a particular argument maybe theme maybe image maybe any incident and the things are being repeated repeated in a seemingly meaningless manner but somewhere deep somewhere within there is some suggestion of the inherent meaning that man has to confront that man has to realize so in this way martin eslin is defining out of the experiments in different parts of europe with different playwrights a common characteristic and he is terming it as the theater of the absurd so from this we can encounter two types of questions one relating to what is the theater of absurd what are the characteristics of theater of absurd and how it is contrasted or how it is compared with the conventional theater or maybe existentialist theater or poetic avant-garde and the second question can be asked about the anecdote that presentation of the play on 19 november 1957 in san quentin penitentiary and its repercussion its effect on the audience the convicts 
and how from that effect on the audience martin neslin is forming out his own arguments about a new emerging theatrical movement i hope you will be able to do justice to your answers